Hello, my name is Zena Caldhorn Kamiri, and I was born in Hamburg, Germany in 1931. That's before Hitler came to power. And then, because of my father's work in Hamburg at the university, we were caught there during the war, and I lived there all my childhood during World War II. My parents, very different. My mother was a blonde, blue-eyed, fair-haired uh, lady from England, very English, raised under Queen Victoria's era. And her husband, my father, was an Arab from Tunis, Tunisia. And he was dark, olive-skinned, and a very curious-minded person. My brother was born in Cairo, Egypt. My other brother was born in England. And I was born in Germany. Why? Because my father at that time was a professor of languages teaching at the Hamburg University, and his job kept us in Hamburg. But I feel I must give you a little background of the history of that time to understand what it was to be raised in Germany during World War II under this amazing person, Adolf Hitler. He came to power in 1933, but he came in a wonderful vacuum of history. Remember, 1928 was the Great Depression of the world. Everybody's money it didn't sink. It was raised in paper money, they said. I wasn't there to, to witness it, that if you wanted to buy a loaf of bre bread, you had a barrel full of paper money. That's how worthless money became. And with it, jobs were cut, and uh, the world was in bad shape, job-wise, money-wise, health-wise, and, and food-wise. So the Depression of 1928, Hitler was a mature man at that time, and it was in this vacuum that he came as the leader of Germany. <coughs> uh, remember that communism was rising as the uh, savior of the world. Um, Marx and Lenin, uh, full of their new philosophy, um, throw away the Bible, throw away God, we are going to be the gods of communism and bring peace into the world. <clears throat> so here, 1931, I was born, and 1933, Hitler was elected as president of Germany. And what did he promise? Work, health care, education, and in a little later, when he got the German people, that's all they wanted. Work, health care, and education. Yes, he brought about the best schools in the world. Number one, education. And of course, parents were thrilled. My child is in the best school possible. Work, yes, Hitler gave them work. I have a documentary where I see these columns of German people, not marching, but working, walking in columns with a shovel over their shoulder, not a gun, a shovel. And they were marched to the workplace and there they started digging, digging, digging. This is in the 1930s, digging the first um, autobahn, traffic, um, what you call them, highways. We didn't have highways before that, and you didn't have many cars as you do now. So they were digging, 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 and busy working and using all their strength. And it wasn't until after World War II, 20 years later, that America copied, and now we have highways, and other countries in the world have highways. Germany started it, and he had 
them, give, give them work and best schools and health care. Yes, we all uh, paid our income tax and from that income tax you had one health care provider, not the many competing health care providers that we have today. And who gets rich? All the competing health care uh, whatnots. But we just had one health care and any German could go to any doctor, any dentist, any hospital and was looked after. So with these three, the German people I'm trying to give you to understand why they could believe in him, vote for him, work for him. And then he added, once they were solidifying, he added, we're going to build the thousand year Reich. Reich means kingdom, power. Just as the, um, the Roman power, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, we had no empire at the moment, but Hitler promised them the Germanic um, uh, Empire, Thousand Year Reich. The Romans only had a 700 year Reich. And I have to ask you, how old is America? It's a little baby still in diapers, 200 years old. No, the Roman Empire was a great empire. Germany was going to uh, supersede that with a thousand year Reich. And the German people, I want you to try and understand, they had health care, they had jobs, they had the best education in the world. Yes, they were going to have a Germanic Empire. Just to give you the feel why the majority of Germans believed in him. And uh, these are my words. It was time for them to throw out the Bible, throw out God. They had a living God, the Führer. Führer means leader. And they could see him. Say, so we're following him. So I just wanted to give you the feel of the culture uh, in those days to understand, don't have to agree with them, but to understand why the German people on the whole were following him. And of course there were a few who did not. You all know the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Well he represents many Germans who did not believe in the Germanic um, Thousand Year Reich. Well, off with your head, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And indeed, um, just before the end of the war, he was um, um, killed. So there were many Germans and other people who, if they expressed ideas contrary to the Germanic Reich, uh, would be silenced. And we learned to live in those surroundings. Now, coming back to my family, we were being subtly brainwashed through the schools, through the uh, propaganda on the news. You weren't allowed to listen to the BBC of England. No, no, no. Only the German news and propaganda. And um, so the German people were brainwashed into believing in the coming Germanic uh, Reich. Strangely enough, in the last one and a half to two years especially because of the change in our politics, our culture and our thinking, this World War II experience is coming back to life as never before, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And I feel urged to talk about it because history often repeats itself. And there are similarities of what is going on in our educational system, brainwashing us to think a certain thing and be ready for a new culture uh, emerging in the world. It's just recently that it's very important to me to talk about it and I think about it a lot. Well, I have five children and I feel very strongly that I didn't tell them everything 
about myself as a person. I simply was a mother, and that's a very um, creative, demanding job, that I feel I want to tell them a little more about myself to understand me, and that a lot of World War II is in my, <laughs> I was going to say it's in my blood, it's in my being, it's in my, it's in my life and what I'm doing today, I want to be sure that I'm not um, influenced by that. So that's why I want to talk about it. Well, we are moving on in time. It's 1939. World War II started. I was eight eight and a half years old, and it cut right into my life. I sensed, even if I didn't understand politics, I sensed something big had happened, and my parents were talking about it. So, 1939, World War II started, and Germany was as quick as anything from Poland, Ukraine, um, um, uh, Romania, uh, Macedonia, uh, Italy, they didn't have to worry about. Italy was a, um, an ally of Germany, but all the southern countries, the eastern countries, right up to France and all the northern countries, um, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, were all under German control within less than one year and very little fighting. They were all taken by surprise, but Germany marched in and took over. And Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles, über alles in der Welt was the um, <clears throat> hymn that the Germans used to sing, which means Germany, Germany, over everything in the world. Germany, Germany. <clears throat> so we started World War II. And my parents wanted to get out of Germany, but no more traveling was allowed. He had a job lined up in Lebanon at the university, but no traveling allowed. Um, so there we were in Germany, and in a very public place. This was the beginning of the war. Uh, in a very public place, suddenly they had a special Sondermeldung. They would interrupt everything with the radio in stores and everything. Sondermeldung, um, Germany has just sunk a British ship with 2,000 British soldiers. U-boats. Who had U-boats? Germany. Germany was leading in technology and everything. And these U-boats under the water managed to uh, torpedo this um, ship and all these 2,000 um, British soldiers were drowned, and my mother's face fell. She had three brothers, all in British uniforms, cousins, neighbors, friends, and her face dropped. One of the Germans saw that and reported her to the police that she was a foreigner and she was not happy. And she received notice to come to the uh, uh, police station where a German uh, officer would interrogate her, a high Nazi official. But later on my mother told me, the first thing I told this Nazi officer was, Germany will never get away with what she is doing to the Jews. <gasps> and this Nazi officer looked around, don't ever say that again. And he looked around to see if there was anybody in the room, whether the doors were closed, and that nobody heard it. And he said, never say that again. And wherever you're living now, move. Hamburg is a big city, over one or two million people. Move and live somewhere else and don't talk like that again. And if ever you are in trouble like this again, ask for me said this Nazi officer interrogating my English mother. <laughs> well, my father being Arab, during the war, 
sort of kept us safe. We just had to report to the police every week, but we weren't put in camps or anything. And they kept my father at the university because they were building the German Thousand Year Reich, and that meant that they needed languages. They were going to rule the whole world. Little did they know that my father, an Arab, and my mother had helped a lot of Jews before the war to get out of Germany. But of course they kept quiet about that. So we were in the war and the first two years of the war Germany was winning everywhere. They had what they called the Blitzkrieg. Blitz means um, thunder and lightning, lightning war, because they went from one country to the other. And it was all under the German flag. Two years, and that gave England a chance to make ammunition, build war planes, and in 1943, Hamburg was a huge city on the rim of a river which opened up to the North Sea. Water, water, and it was an ideal place to have ship building factories, ammunition building factories, and the British had to put a stop to that. So it was of strategic military importance to bomb part of Hamburg. The British, before they came to bomb, let down little leaflets and dropped them on the whole city of Hamburg during the day. And there they were lying these leaflets. Of course, no German was allowed to pick up what the enemy had dropped down. But of course, we wanted to know what did the British say in these. So I remember playing outside, pretending I was playing, and uh, smuggling one of these uh, leaflets in my uh, pants, and then continuing to play. But after a certain amount of time, because we knew all the apartment buildings either side of the street were looking at these papers and no good German would be allowed to pick up something from the enemy. So we ran inside and showed it to my mother and here in perfect German was written, Hamburg is going to be a battlefield for three nights. Women and children get out. And my parents believed what that little leaflet said, and they uh, started uh, making sandwiches and packing up things that evening to have a picnic at night. And we took the train. Most people didn't have cars. We took the train and got out of Hamburg as far as the train would go. And I shall never forget that. This train was chock-a-block full. I was only um, 12 years old. Children weren't allowed to sit. No, no, they were teaching them manners and discipline. So here I was squeezed amongst men, but the silence was ominous. Nobody talked. It was as if they said, I won't talk to you and don't you talk to me and ask me, what am I doing in the evening on a train going on a picnic out of Hamburg? Because nobody dared say, well, we read what the British said and we believe them <laughs> and we are trying to get out of trouble and get out of that inferno. <clears throat> well, I might be smiling now looking at you all, but allow me to go back a moment because the food that I was fed during World War II was fear, bombs, death, hunger, constant bombing, death. Stalingrad, a city in Russia, was the turning point of the war 
when the Russians encircled the German army and cut them off from ammunition supplies, food supplies, clean clothing. And when you're afraid, things happen in your clothing. No clothing, no food, no ammunition, and the Russian army all around them and colder than Germans had ever experienced. Russians were used to it. They knew how to dress for cold weather. But the Germans had to throw down their guns, put up their hands, and give up. The whole German army gave up Stalingrad and was walked as prisoners of war. And even I suddenly felt that the Germans were human beings. I remember reading about one German soldier who had um, pain in his foot, but he couldn't take off his boot when they came to a place to sleep. And he asked a fellow soldier to take off his boot. And he took off his boot, and in it was part of his foot. frozen to death. And I don't know how many thousands of the uh, German soldiers never returned home after the war. Anyway, I just want to leave you with the reality of war. And I thought of death. I didn't know every night that it was being bombed, whether my family would be there the next morning or not, whether I would be alive. Life, death, life, death, fear, hunger, cold was a reality. And then the war ended and just before it ended, Hitler, their, their living God, their Führer, Hitler committed suicide. So did Goebbels, with his beautiful wife and five children, gave them pills to put them to sleep. Germany was traumatized. And the mayor of Hamburg, the city I lived in, quickly, once Hitler was dead, he thought, good, I don't have to listen to him anymore. And he quickly communicated with the British, and in this case Montgomery, and said, Hamburg will surrender unconditionally. Just come, come and take us and become our occupation troop. We finished with Hitler and Germany and war. Our British soldiers were our commanders in chief now. And over the radio they announced, we are in charge and you are under our command, <laughs> hamburgers. Um, nobody is allowed on the streets after 6 p.m. before 6 a.m. Anybody on the street at that time will be shot, no questions asked. All right, we understood. <laughs> but then, in a few days, we saw on the public advertisement boards in Hamburg, um, big pictures about half the size of this table, two and a half by two and a half feet, big pictures of Holocaust survivors in their striped pajamas, skin and bones, fear in their eyes, photos of these, all over Hamburg and underneath in big black letters, this is what you Germans have done. And the German people, including myself, were um, around these um, advertising boards, looking at them. And British soldiers reported to Montgomery, or whoever was in charge um, of the British Army then, um, the German people don't believe it. We hear them talk and they say, we didn't, we Germans didn't do that. They did it and they're trying to um, make us responsible for it. But we Germans didn't do that. And Montgomery gave the order the next day 
um, take as many trucks as you can uh, and pick up German men, not old men, not young boys, and not women. Pick up men, no excuses, put them on the trucks and drive them to the Holocaust camp. And I think the one nearest us was Buchenwald. There were about eight camps in Germany, um, uh, Poland of course the most awful ones, but they were driven to the camp and the German people had to get out of the trucks and move in the camps and the British soldiers said you can talk to the inmates and they looked at them with fear, these inmates, what's happening now? All the German soldiers have left, we had no food, and then these British soldiers came, they didn't know the war um, strategy, that what was going on, and now all these German people asking us questions. And the British soldiers made sure that the German people went through the camps, make them go into the camps, and you had three, sometimes four layers of uh, beds, one on top of the other. And you know when you are dying, <laughs> the excrement from your body goes all over the place and into the mattresses. So the smell in some of these um, uh, camps was awful. But the order was make the Germans go through it and take it in and talk to these inmates and then go back to Hamburg and tell the Hamburgers what they saw in Germany. And then we started talking to some of the Germans who were driven to the camps. I remember that. Well, the Holocaust was an awful, awful reality. Never mind Iran saying it's just a made-up lie. No, no, no. We almost saw it. So, I'm in England now. <laughs> well, to make a long story short, one day I came home from school and uh, there was this British officer in our apartment. British, British. And my mother said, Zena, this is my brother your uncle. He's come to find us because during the war there was no communication possible, no telephoning, no letters, nothing. So our English relatives didn't know whether we were alive or dead. They found us and my mother said, we're going to England. <laughs> my life began to change. In a few months I was in England, all of us. And my relatives put me in an English boarding school for young ladies. Ah, what a medicine that was after Hitler's teaching and war. Boarding school for young ladies in England. It changed me. It changed me. So, what I've just now said about the war, the Holocaust, death, fear, hunger. It's in me. That's why I have to say it, because I don't want it to happen again. Now I'm in a new world, 
At present, at this moment, I'm in New Mexico. But in the meantime, 20, 30, 40 years ago, I got married. I did have children. And I always lived in cities, big cities, Montreal, Toronto. I used to live in London. I trained there as a nurse, not to mention Hamburg. <laughs> always in cities that were millions and millions of citizens. But now I'm in the greatest place I could be. Where? In the desert of New Mexico. Taos, New Mexico. A poor state. But you know, I say it with, um, with appreciation. There is uh, beauty in poverty. And you see the beauty of it here in Taos. And I live in an earth ship. Anybody heard of an earth ship? I helped build it. It's built of old car tires, pounded with a lot of um, soil, pounded so that there isn't one bit of air in it, and they're about 300 pounds in weight, and they are stacked one on top of the other, and those are my walls. My walls are two to three feet thick. And the other thing about earth ships is it always faces the sun. And the windows go from the floor diagonally up and to the ceiling. And all the rooms are f uh, behind those windows don't have doors. They all have the sunshine coming in and warming those tire-made walls. And if you look at my walls, you can see the unevenness of tires, because I adobed it. And I thought, oh dear, they must have been talking too much here. Look at the uneven tires there, because once you've set it down, you can't move it 300 pounds. And I thought, I'll have to fill it in with adobe. But my son said, no, 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 you leave that wall to me. And he is a real artist at heart. And look at the artwork that he's brought into that uneven wall of tires. <laughs> but let's give um, Mike Reynolds the respect he deserves. He is the inventor and designer and builder of earthships, Mike Reynolds. And he used to give lectures in Cincinnati at the university where my um, son and daughters were studying. And this one son of mine, Peter, really an artist at heart, he was fascinated. It wasn't that um, I helped him build the earth ships, <laughs> but I did a tiny little bit. He was the main one. But uh, we had no paid workers. All my five children, their spouses and friends, came and we all built it together. And in the winter, I have no heat. The sun warms these tire-filled walls and reflects it back during the night. In bed it's cold, but a nice hot water bottle, an extra blanket, and you can warm up easily. But um, during the day, the sun takes over. We need to save the world with earth ships built into the earth and um, cut off from the need of electricity for heat, the need of um, water, because you can have your own well. It gives me a feeling of security. Never mind what shape the world is taking when the plug is pulled in a city. <laughs> so today, what a day compared with World War II. I feel blessed. And I say that word very carefully because I know Things are happening today, you just listen to the news, and I am very conscious, especially when I have food of choice on the table, 
And we hear it on the news almost every day. Not hundreds, but thousands of refugees leaving their homes, leaving all the things, leaving all the things that make a home a home and just carrying a bag and many times not any food, dirty water to drink and countries unable to take any more and more refugees because they still are coming. And I have everything. So allow me to say it again. I am blessed. And especially around this table, there's nothing greater for me than to have it surrounded with friends. And they all bring food. And we have a potluck that is rich as anything. Food and fellowship. And I realize there's nothing greater May I say it again? Nothing greater than fellowship over food and a drink. That, that is the greatest blessing for me in my life. But I go back a few decades when I got out of the rubble and ruin of World War II and was in England in boarding school and nobody taught me. Nobody took me and said you've got to think this way. No, the English way of living in silence. Silence taught me a lot but with it the books I had to read. For once we were allowed to read Shakespeare, which you weren't allowed in Germany. <laughs> and with history and geography and math and religion and uh, exercise, uh, all the things that I had to learn that were not in the German curriculum. And I used to take my books home in order to catch up learning, because I realized that with all the bombing and everything, a lot of school was missing. And it opened my eyes to a new world. Here I am, Zena Kamiri, that's my father's name, and when I got married, his name was Kolshorn. And of all things, he was German. <laughs> Of all things, there's one thing my mother said, Zena, when you grow up, you can marry anybody except a German. <laughs> and here I married a German. But we had gone through the same things and there was an understanding. I am blessed. Thank you, Lord.